What's happening, y'all? This is Todd Wilson with another episode of Elevate Your Game. Today, we have special guest, head varsity coach at St. Bonaventure uh, and director of admissions and outreach at St. Bonaventure as well, Mr. Wolfgang Wood. I appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so man. much. Thank you so much. 100%, man. We'd love to start this show off with the Wall of Hoop movies. Your favorite hoop movie of all time and why? Oof, it's probably got to be... Like Mike 2. It's definitely, no, it's not like Mike too. never. <laughs> um, but I would say, I would say he got game just because um, I think it was cool that they had Ray Allen in there um, as an actual NBA player in there. And I, I've watched that movie countless times. I think I see a new thing in there, but I, I like the whole story about it. The um, kind of gives you a feel for, for kind of reality of basketball, but definitely he got game. Uh, it's probably easily my favorite. Yeah. I'm wondering because I think, uh, Classic. is It is what probably the most said movie, I think, of our generation. Because um, we all wanted to live that life a little bit. <laughs> I, uh, but without, you know, without the heartache and pain, like, people don't realize, like, mom's, like, mom's passed away. Like, that was his real motivation, a chip yeah. on his shoulder. Yeah. And him blaming his pops yeah. for it for so long is crazy. Yeah. And him... You know, the reconciliation, like there's a real love story in there that uh, people are missing, you know? <laughs> it's, it's like I said, I, I watched that thing when I was 15 and I was a 15 year like, oh, he's just playing basketball. And, right. and then as I got older, I think I took more away from it when I was in my yes. 20s. I was like, oh, this is a lot deeper than I thought. And Crazy. so um, definitely each time I watch it, I think I learned a little bit more and see it from a different perspective than when I was 15 and just like, oh, Ray Allen's really good. Yeah. So. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, that, it made all of us Ray Allen fans for sure. Exactly. That was when Ray Allen was doing more than just shooting. He was dunking was, on people. and Milwaukee Bucks Ray Allen. Yes. That's, that's definitely the, the Ray Allen I know. 100%. So when did you fall in love with basketball? I would say, I mean, kind of was born into it just with everyone in my family played. But I think I really got into it. Honestly, kind of middle, like mid middle school, because my, my parents had me play a lot of sports growing up. So I played soccer and baseball, and I was a baseball player first, but then basketball I think eventually caught up to me, and I I enjoyed it in like the rec leagues, and then kind of moved into the club thing and played a little bit more. And I think once it got really competitive is when I was like, oh, this is really fun. Like right. not in the NJB, but like when we really started playing high comp, I was like, okay, I love playing. And yeah. so probably. Sixth, seventh grade is when I loved playing. Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed it, but that's when I had like a passion to want to keep playing and be involved in it. What changed then? I think just my my parents kind of let me play. So they were like, you're going to figure it out. Like, you'll like it if you like it. And so being able to just go into it, I kind of like saw it from a very naive lens, I guess you can say, where mm -hmm. it was just more pure. Like I liked it because I just played and I liked the competition. And I think in that... Like, I like fast-paced competition, so I loved baseball, but it was a little slow, especially, yeah. like, in middle school, elementary school, it's slow. And then basketball, it was fun, it was high pace, and I was like, this is really cool. And so the adrenaline part, I think, just got me more wanting to keep playing. Um, and as you get older, you kind of develop more skills and kind of love it more in that, too. So definitely, um, those are the reasons why I definitely, you know, enjoyed it more growing up and loved it growing up. And your dad played, right? He's a, a yes. kind of a hoop legend around <clears throat> these parts. Yeah, he... Um, <laughs> Played, you know, he was at St. Monica, uh, St. Monica Prep now. I know it was St. Monica, I think it was St. Monica Catholic, yeah. um, now St. Monica Prep. Um, and he was a very good player there. Um, I know uh, we played in their uh, showcase early on and, and saw all his accolades. And then played at Cal State Fullerton, uh, was an All-American there. And then got drafted 10th overall in the 84 draft. Um, Olympic gold medalist. Played uh, eight years in the NBA and then played some overseas. And now he's a ref going on to 28 years. I he's think. an NBA ref. Yes. Wow. So he refs the NBA 28 years, I believe he's on right now. I could be off by a year or two, but he's about, he's 20, at least as almost as long as I've been alive, he's been refing. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. And yeah. so he lets you just fall in love with the game. He didn't push you and force you to play basketball at all. He no. Have you in the gym doing drills all night? <laughs> no. Grinding 24 seven? No, not at and all. you still ended up playing basketball. Uh, yes. So imagine absolutely. that. <laughs> And, and, and the crazy part is, you know, my mom played. My mom played at UCLA. Uh, my sister played at Seton Hall. Oh, wow. And they all were just like, go ahead and play. If you want to play, you want to play. And so it was really cool. Like, I think that just made it a lot easier that I didn't feel any pressure or expectation. It was like, do you like playing? Yes. Okay, then play another season. Once again, do you like playing? Yes. Okay, then keep playing. And so 
it was so much easier and it made me want to work harder knowing that I didn't have like a pressure to be this person and I was able to just be a player. Yeah. And so it was, it was cool. It was really cool growing up in that kind of atmosphere. It was competitive, but it was cool. Right, right. And so you were down in Orange County at the time? Yes, yes. Uh, grew up in Orange County my whole, my whole life through high school. Mm. Uh, went to Santa Margarita Catholic. Um, I came in the year after Clay Thompson graduated. Gotcha. Um, and okay. so he just won state there and then we had a whole new group and, um, played for Jerry DeBusk. I don't know if you know Jerry DeBusk, yeah. but played for Jerry and high school was interesting. Trinity league basketball is interesting, um, right. in a good way. I mean, here I am loving playing NJ, you know, NJB and AAU. And then as a sophomore, it's like, okay, here is Cesar Guerrero and Gabe York <laughs> and Stanley. And I, I had no idea who these guys were. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is Trinity League basketball. This is crazy. Right. So um, went there, played all four years there, uh, three-year varsity guy there. I played freshman basketball, which I always recommend people if, you know, you have a chance to, to play freshman or JV basketball rather than. Wait, you so. play freshman basketball and you end up going to college for basketball yes. as well? Yes, yes. I thought you were going to do that. Sorry, yes. man. You're, yes. <laughs> I'm being so sorry. I, I, <laughs> parents need to hear this and, and believe it that there is a process to this. Yes. And getting your, getting your feet wet into high school. High school is such a big jump. And, and so don't get me wrong. There are the star-studded freshmen. There are. There, and that's totally fine. I played freshman basketball. Um, and then And I loved it. And I got every rep in the world. I played every minute of every game, yes. loved it. Our coach would say, play until you foul out. That was the whole thing. Oh, so nice. I played all the time. Sophomore year, I made varsity. Did not play a lot to, to honestly, I didn't play a lot halfway, more than halfway through that year. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, getting used to it. And I'm a sophomore. Like I was, you know, very you know skinny and not strong enough. And we had a lot of seniors. And then two guys got hurt in my spot, middle through league. First start was at Bosco. And they're like, well, mm -hmm. It's not like part of it is you worked hard, but part of it is guys got hurt. You got to start. And yeah. so, and then from there, it just like, I think because I had so many reps as a freshman being a guy, I went into that game and I'm so young and naive. I had the rational comments like I can do this. Like I've done it before. Right. And so I ended up, um, I think I had 25 in that first game Oh wow! at, at Bosco. And, and it just helped though. Like I had experience and I try to tell like young kids that like, if you have a chance to play lower levels, you get like game reps are irreplaceable. I knew how to be not a guy, but I knew how to survive in an atmosphere because I've done it only a year ago. And so yeah. I mean, it was really cool. It was really cool. I, I always recommend if, if you have that option as a freshman, it's not the end of the world. If you play freshman basketball or JV, it's not, you get valuable game reps. 100%. 100%. percent. <laughs> I want to go back to NJB. You're the first person. So We've had like 50 people on the show at this point. Mm -hmm. You're the first person to say NJB. I played NJB too. That's where I got my start. <laughs> NJB. I, was 11, I was 11 years NJB. old. NJB. Man, I loved NJB. So organized. Very well organized mm -hmm. league. And yeah. like a step up above Park and Rec, I think, yes. and below AAU. But mm -hmm. NJB was amazing for me. And I had an awesome coach. And did your dad coach you in at all during your youth? No, my mom did. <laughs> oh, <makes> sense, okay. <laughs> my mom Mom's did. She hooped too. Okay. So um, NJB, I did it you know, first through fifth grade um, or you know, third through fifth grade around that time. And then um, I loved it just because it, it, it was a little more organized than rec. Like you couldn't play zone a certain quarter. Yeah. You couldn't press until the last two minutes or something like that. So it was mm -hmm. kind of cool because you, you had to guard to a degree and you had to, you know, do certain things to a degree. You had to learn certain concepts. And then that transition into all net, I think it was called all net. Yep. And that was kind of like the in between of NJ being AAU. Mm -hmm. And then we had, you know, Orange County, we were such a small area right there. All my friends, we played together and we were all in all net in fifth grade. And then we just made a little, I guess, club team. Same thing. And we played sixth, seventh, eighth grade together. And all of us went to Santa Margarita together. And so, and my mom was our coach and she was, I tell everyone to this day, she's the hardest coach I've ever played for. Why? Um, because her... She was as old school as it got in terms of she would run motion you and she would tell us in game, I need eight passes before you even look at a shot. Pa pass and screen away motion? Yes. Yeah. Pass and screen yeah. away. And she would tell us eight passes before you score. And if we didn't do it, she would go get him. <laughs> so like, <laughs> it didn't matter who you were. I, I had I a bro. I, I, I got in and ripped and went for a lay and she took me out and goes, I said eight passes. Love and then in practice, it was... If you didn't get in a stance, if you didn't do this, she would make us run with our hands above our shoulders. And that was like, 
you didn't realize until right there, like how hard that was, but she was just a very, like she would tell us discipline. She, I tell this story to, and this story gets funnier every time she would take our club. when we were in sixth grade, first thing as a club team, and we're all from South Orange County. She would take us to Linwood High School because they used to have tournaments mm -hmm. every weekend, if I remember. Mm -hmm. And she would take us there and she says, you guys need to play against tougher competition. And we would lose the first, we went to four or five tournaments and I think we would lose by 40 every game. And she goes, we're going to go back. We're going back until you figure it out. And eventually it was lost by 25, lost by 20, lost by 12, lost by five. And then finally we won one. And she goes, okay, we're going to keep coming back until you can win some more. And yeah. so that kind of like taught us in middle school, like you got to play better people. You got to be tougher, more disciplined. And so that was, I tell her, my mom was the hardest coach by far. Yeah. In, in a good way. I mean, right. it was a good way. But it's she, a discipline and structure it was. that is missing from today's youth game. Yes. Everybody's about winning and being on somebody's mixtape and getting all this clout as a mm -hmm. young player instead of learning to play the right way and yeah. with discipline. Yeah. And, and like you said, like the kids think they're in a box now because a coach calls a play. Mm -hmm. We literally had to make eight passes before we shot, <laughs> even in the game. Like in a real yeah. game, that was literally the rule, regardless if you can go by somebody. Yep, and, and, that, and that was the thing. And, and, and I was a pretty athletic guy, so like I tell people, like I don't think you guys understand. I Some coaches will call stuff, but at the end, end of the day, you get a ball screen at the end of the set, and you get to play and do your thing. My mom, it was like, you're going here, and if you don't go here, you're coming out. And so it was like, okay. And so that way I just, I was great because in that time I learned about spacing and, and cutting. And I think that's something that's missing in youth basketball is everyone kind of like follows the ball. I want the ball. I want the ball. And they follow it. Mm -hmm. And where we had to learn spacing, you had to be in the corners, the wings and the top. And, yes. and so it was easier for me in high school to adjust finally to that time because we ran stuff like that at, at Santa Margarita. So I think that is missing though in youth is, is just being very disciplined because if you get that part down then you can be a really good scorer if you just know spacing and know certain concepts right. that that i feel like is missing in youth basketball 100 percent. that's those are my biggest anchor points when i go in and teach a new group teach about spots on the court this is where you stand on the perimeter this is where you attack through this is how you move when the ball moves all those things are so vital yeah. to a kid surviving in high school and more importantly in college when they you know if they get there yeah you know, so absolutely um what was the name of your club team what did you guys call yourselves <laughs> oc slam oc slam. oc slam <laughs> um was the first and we joined it because we had a there was a guy who he had a gym and he's like we want you to be our sixth grade team but you have to wear a jersey we were oc okay. slam and then we became i think just like eagles or something like that i don't know we had our jerseys were literally we went to big five and got some jerseys and at first we taped numbers on then we finally put like actual numbers on so <laughs> I, I think it made more teams upset because when we actually started winning games up there like these are established club teams like we're losing to a team with tape numbers on their jerseys right now and we're like yeah like that's, that's us we do. <laughs> and, and we're all you know it's, it's we're south orange county kids we go to the beach before the game or after the game so it's just annoying you see these kids walking in and we're we're you know we're laid back but then we go on the court and we're disciplined and then we have tape jerseys on so i think it was kind of our identity we wanted to just annoy teams as much as possible with that kind of identity but yes. it was um oc slam and then i think we were the eagle i think we were eagles something like that awesome awesome what what are your skills as a player what were your skills on the court what did people look for you to do um when i was in high school i was a slasher i was a very i was a slasher i was a point guard um and then as i got to college i got injured a little bit in high school which kind of took the athletic part away but as i got to college i became more of my mom taught me how to post up before i dribbled before i learned how to dribble so i learned how to be a post player first and so i ended up kind of being a post guard i guess mm -hmm. um and so I, I guess when i got to college it was more of catch and shoot threes or i would post up guards if they were smaller than me but in high school i was a slasher i would get it and i would try to go as fast as i can full court and get fouled. I, I could draw fouls, you know. I got to do it again. So you <laughs> learned how to po be a post player, and you were still a point guard in high school? Yes. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> it's making sure people hear that. It's, it's you know, it's and just. And you're not that old. Let's, like, I would have, Wolfgang is not old, people. This is how you develop a basketball player, yeah. by giving them the fundamentals yeah. and the details of how to play any position on the yeah. court. And you become the position that you need for your team. Yeah. At the end and and that was, and that was the thing was just at an early age, it was taught you need to know multiple kind of skills because 
you're not going to be a point guard forever. Someone could be better at you at point guard. And so then how are you going to be, how are you going to get on the floor? Well, I know how to post up. I could play three. I could post up. I could play a two if you run this offense or whatever it is. And so my mom taught me how to post up and it was just drop step and up and unders. And my sister was a post player too. So not only was I getting my butt whooped by my sister in the post growing up, I watched her and she was, she was, I tell everyone she's one of the best basketball players I ever watched. And so uh, watching her be a post player and then it was learn how to do a pull up jumper, learn how to shoot a mid range pull up, learn how to do those. And then it got to like, I didn't shoot threes until college really. Like I would shoot them if I was not guarded completely, but I, I learned the, the, I worked my way from inside out rather than I think nowadays I see kids try to be a three point shooter first. And then you tell them to do a drop step and they look at it like it's foreign. Right. And so I was more of, I learned the inside part and built out and I didn't learn to really shoot well until maybe my first year of college. Wow. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> and who taught you how to shoot? Um, my dad taught me some mechanics cause my dad could shoot it well. And then, um, you know, it was mainly my dad. My mom was a post player really only. And then my sister was a really good shooter. She was, she was, and she learned from your back. I have this theory that, um, when dads who play basketball teach their kids how to shoot, they have shots. Like, yeah, that's literally, I, I seen that. Yeah. My, years. my dad, um, taught me. And then my sister taught me. My sister was, uh, like I said, exceptional shooter. She was, she, I think she holds school records still at SM. She was 95% from free throw line. Wow. And so it was, whoa. Yeah. 95. Yes. 95. Whitney didn't miss. That means she missed one, one Whitney, free throw. Whitney <laughs> did not, Whitney did not miss. When you miss, you're like, oh, like. That's, that's very unordinary. That's and so, but my dad taught me how to shoot. And then he just taught me to, like, I learned the value of reps of you have to do shooting game reps. So when I got to college and they had the shooting gun, you know, I was on there every day trying to make, you know, four or 500, like I was trying to make a lot of them. And so yeah. that's how I ended up getting better at shooting. Cause I, I don't think in high school, I understood how many shot reps you have to get to make your shot. Yes. Um, consistent so I was in high school I was inconsistent I'd make three threes in a game that I go over eight but in college I kind of learned the value of consistency and on a shot and I think that's what helped is just they kind of put that in my brain like you have to shoot every day oh okay and so I did that after I would work on some other things too absolutely um so going through um AAU ball you're in Southern California um, and then, so do you play with that same AAU team through high school as well? Or did you? No, no, I, um, I didn't just because most of the kids on the team weren't basketball guys first. So they, they went off and played other sports. So my sophomore year, I played for pump and run okay. with, with the pump brothers. So to this day, I still laugh. Um, I played two years with the pump, with pump and run. Uh, my first year coach, Mike Hamill. Oh, yeah. was was my coach my first year and then Christian Arand and Ryan Silver right. were my coach my second year and so um that was my first introduction to high level AAU and I went to a tryout at Dominguez High School Dominguez Hills which I felt like every event was at Dominguez yes. at that era <laughs> <laughs> um and it was crazy like I, I I'm going to this and there's all these tryouts and I it was really cool, but I, that was, I was kind of overstimulated. I was like, whoa, these are, there's all these kids and this isn't OC slam. Like this is, <laughs> this is crazy. And so, um, I played for them and I loved it. I, I tell everyone pump, the pump brothers were great to me. Um, I met some of my best friends through that. I still, one of my best friends is Roscoe Allen who played at Gorman and Stanford, mm -hmm. one of my best friends to this day. And it was fun. I just, I learned so much about AAU, I think that I didn't even realize and that I know now just from playing yeah. at that kind of level. Like I learned about the circuits. I think back then it was the Adidas. The pumps had their own circuit, I think. Yeah, um, and all the independent, it, yeah, own, they ran their own tournaments. Yeah. I, I didn't realize like how much people traveled in that. Le like we went to Minnesota and Denver and I'm sitting here like, geez, and I thought playing in Linwood was far. <laughs> like we're on a plane now going to Denver. And yeah. so played for them for two years. And then, and I, and I talked about sacrifice. I had, I lived in Orange County and they practiced at a Simi Valley high school and I took the train to, from Orange County to Simi Valley for practices. Two hours? About two hours on the train. We'd get off the train, walk to Simi Valley high school, walk back to the train and go back. Um, just because my, you know, parents are working and that's, yeah. that's a hard commitment, but I wanted to play and, um, it was fun. I mean, we had some, some really good Valley players. I know Zena Edelwansman was oh, yeah. on my team. 
um, Kennedy Edwards, who went to Notre Dame. Now that I'm like out here, I'm like, wow, that's those are huge with those schools. Yeah. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie was on the older team, a year older. So here I am at 15 trying to guard Spencer Dinwiddie, and it wasn't fun. Um, <laughs> and so it was cool. Did it for two years, and then I played for a local team back home um, again, um, just because I just wanted to kind of finish with my friends again. Um, and so I, I left Pump and Run and played for, I think it was, we called, we called ourselves SoCal Soldiers and it really had nothing to do with trying to be Oakland Soldiers. It was our, our coach was an army person, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we were playing tournaments there. It was me and a couple of my friends. Um, and it's funny because a couple of them are actually coaches now. So it was kind of cool having oh, cool. having some guys that are coaches. Uh, Jared Cook, Westcliff uh, oh, yeah. University head coach was on my team. So it was really cool having some coaches there. Um, but finished AAU there and, um, it was really cool though. I really enjoyed it. I, I thought I had a good experience, but all those things helped me learn about the ins and outs of AAU. And when you go to a team, this is what you need to look for. This is what you need to look out for. What schedule do they play? Are they in the main tournament or are they in the, the B tournament in the secondary gym? Are you, you know, there's a lot of these things I think that, that helps that parents have to know too with the AAU yes. process and picking a team. 100%. No, that, and that is... I want to actually let's dive into that more. You know, you playing on a more independent, smaller team, local team versus yeah. playing on a national level team. You know, what are the key differences? You kind of mentioned some of them where they play, but um, if I'm a parent walking into the gym, what are three questions I would ask the program director to get a good view of what I'm joining or having my kid join? I would ask them if you're an independent team, what circuit are you playing on in terms of what. And there's all types of circuits, but you have to know the top ones. And everyone has a, has you know a, a pro and con to their circuit, so that's not that's not really the conversation. But what circuit are they on, and what's your schedule? Um, I would also ask them, you know, I guess time commitment. How how often are you practicing? Because I feel like a lot of teams might not practice, right. and some teams do. I think the ones that do practice do really well, and some that don't, you just kind of okay. Then you're just throwing players together and you're just playing. So. Where do you, do you practice? What circuit are you on? Um, and then I would also just ask how hard um, for those, if you're an independent team, how hard are you working for your players to get recruited? Yeah. Because I feel like that is, an, if you're an independent team, you're going to have to work really hard. Um, I know that some of the teams have the big name and they're going to draw attention just by drawing attention, which is not a bad thing. But if you're an independent team, you're going to have to work a little bit harder. And I know some people that do all, that that work really hard, but I just know being independent, you have to go a little extra mile for yes. your guys. Um, so those are the top three I would ask if I was a parent or to address a parent. Um, and you kind of weigh those answers and weigh your pros and cons. And no, no, no I think I think that's great. And you're speaking specifically more about high school. Yeah, I want to just make that clear to yeah. the people <laughs> listening that that's more high school than it is yeah. middle school. But those are all important questions. And, yeah, because people don't know because for some reason it's a trade secret what all this circuit and all this stuff means <laughs> unless yeah. you're in the game. And yeah. so um, now most memorable moment on the AAU circuit. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, you already know. Well, it, yeah. right. okay. um, so we, um, it's not even, I don't know if it's positive memory for us, but we, uh, we were in Minnesota uh, pump and run and, and um, this might've been my second year there and we had a good team. Uh, we only lost a handful of games that year. And we, no, no, I'm going to backtrack. That's not even the story. We played at the Super 64 uh, in Vegas, which that was the tournament. Right. That was, I remember it was that in Fab 48. They were kind of going back and forth. And we play in the quarterfinal game, a team called Texas Assault. Oh, boy. And there was a guy on that team named Marcus Smart. And I tell everyone to this day, I haven't been given like 40 like that, but Marcus <laughs> Smart... <laughs> He, I, the, the quote, he took me out back. Let's just go like, it, it was, I, I looked at Cole, I can't do anything. Like he just, he is built the same way now than he was in high school. Right. And I didn't know who he was. So I'm sitting there like, oh, you know, and I think Coach Ron was like, Who's, who wants to try and guard him? I'm like, oh, I'll try and guard him. I don't know him like that. And this is before I knew what rankings were. And he is, so right. I'm like, I got him. <laughs> Halfway through the half, I go, I don't got him. <laughs> like I don't have him at all. It, it was, it was bad. It was, it was. I, I said there was a handful of times I can count where I, I there was not a thing I could have done, and Marcus Smart there was not a thing I could not have done to stop him. <laughs> he went through me like it wasn't like he was hitting jumpers. He just went through me. I'm in the right defensive position, but he just went through me. And so that yeah, that yeah. story to this day, but, oh, who's already got Marcus Smart? Not even close. Not close. You know, and he had Phil Forte on his team who can knock down every shot. Wow. Um, to who went to Oklahoma State, 
Yeah. So not only am I getting ran over by Marcus Smart, Phil Forte probably has six threes over there. So it, it just, it was ugly. It was very ugly. I'm sorry that your most memorable moment was that one. But, but it was cool, though. Oh, yeah, it was You're really playing cool, against though. an NBA player. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, I, and it's cool having played and coached against NBA guys, but Marcus Smart, that was hands down the most memorable just because I can look back and be like, man, I tried to guard him. I didn't do it, but I tried. <laughs> you know, right. so definitely the most memorable moment. That's awesome. Uh, going back to Santa Margarita, so Trinity League, um, you know, known as one of the top leagues in the country. Yes. yes. Uh, like you said, it was filled with uh, future NBA players, future college All Americans. Yeah. Um, how did you prepare for that? Like what? <laughs> it's <laughs> so it's it's hard because I feel like the Trinity League is just as good now than it was back then. I think teams just different teams yeah. fluctuate in getting better or, or worse, but you kind of had to be ready every night and just the pre the prep. And I think like through osmosis, this helped me just prepare as a coach. Like you had to understand every scout because every team was just that good. Even, you know, back then, I think, um, you know, we played Bosco and they had my senior year, they had the Hamilton brothers, Isaac and Daniel Hamilton. Oh Cause Derek, I think Derek Taylor was his first year there. They had Darian Williams. They had a team. I think Tyler Dorsey came the year after, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but you just had to be so attentive to scout mm -hmm. because if you didn't, you were going to get lit up. And I, I even tell my players now or even guys that are playing high-level club or, or in other leagues, against the, the teams that aren't great, you can fall asleep on a scout. Probably, get, probably one out of five times you'll get burned. In those leagues, if you fall asleep on a scout, you're burned. It's five out of five probably every time they're going to they're gonna score on you or they're going to hit that three or you're going to get backdoored for a dunk or something like that. So you had to be prepared. You had to know everyone's weaknesses. We had one through ten. This is what ten guys on the floor do, and this is their strength. And, so, and then you had to deal with environments. I think this is a lost art in high school in general is the student sections aren't as rowdy and loud nowadays some schools are yeah, but across the board Sierra canyon game the other day well yeah Boy, same. oh it's crazy but i mean back <laughs> yes. then i think back then i remember survey on a friday night our coach told us that is the hardest they're the best team in orange county on a friday night at home mm. because they had i think it was called the pit crew back then and we had cards couldn't hear anything it was that loud we had cards with our plays on it because can't hear anything whoa and so you had to be prepared for that you had to be prepared for the hamilton brothers at orange lutheran you had to be prepared for gabe york and peyton banks and and um, James Douglas, you know, then modern day, I was a senior and here's this guy who's a freshman, Stanley Johnson, who was unbelievable. I, <laughs> on on there, his way to a state I think there's a picture of me on Facebook tagged and he's like about to dunk it. And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, this is, you know, and, and so you had to prepare for him. But not only him, he wasn't even the best player yet. They had Caden Reinhardt, Xavier Johnson, oh you know, Jordan Strawberry, who was one of the underrated point guards. And then you go to Jay Sarah and then you have Jamal Eights, Dylan Ositowski, uh, you know, you have just every game, there was no night off. I think that's, I, I talked about the other day, there's no night offs in the Trinity League, there's no night offs in the Mission League, there's no night offs in the Del Rey League, and I think the Golden Coast League, there's no night offs. And so that was just our mindset. There's no night off. Yeah. There's no night where you're like, we're going to win this game. It's like, no, you have to play well to win this game. Right. And so as a high school player, it's just you had to prepare beyond belief. Um, and I think that's something that, like even now, I know now in the training league they have to prepare now, and even mm -hmm. those other leagues I mentioned they have to prepare. Yeah, preparing for a scout because you talk about it. I, I think you know us basketball people know what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. for the younger people or people trying to understand the scout, what what does that mean exactly? Like dive into it just a little bit here mm -hmm. to dissect of oh a scout means I watch them play and I know their habits, but what else does that involve? So I think. Um, in, in, in scout, we look at, I mean, obviously tendencies, um, you'll look at a little bit of tendencies. And even when I watch film, I, I, I don't watch a ton of tendencies. I watch, you know, what actions are they getting most of their shots off of? And then, you know, when you have, usually you go, unless you have a very deep team, your top eight guys of another team, and you kind of have a little brief overview. You don't want to over overload it because I think sometimes, if you over scout, they get too into their head. Yeah. But just a few things like, you know, this guy's a catch and shoot guy, you know. And then you also just know that if he's an elite catch and shoot guy, he's probably been trained to do at least a shot fake one dribble pull up. So you just kind of put that into mind a little bit. Um, and then from there, I don't believe in doing 
all 10 of their sets, their entire playbook, but their top three actions. What do they run most of the game? Okay, yeah. do this. I think out of bounds plays, we go over that a lot because I think those are the most, those are six to eight points a game. I think that yes. just, I look back, I'm like, man, we got beat on eight points of out of bounds plays. So I think those are the ones I probably will go through every single one. But you look at a few actions, a few tendencies, um, and then just a few of those actions. Like those are probably the main things um, because also there's no reinventing the wheel. So there's no set that hasn't been done. You can right. get into any action, but if a screen of screener is happening, it's going to happen. Are you happen. sure? Coaches call it their <laughs> offense all the time. <laughs> and so I just, I just know there's no reinventing the wheels. I know there's yeah. a certain action. You're going to guard this, guard this, guard this. There's no play that hasn't had an end result that I haven't seen before or any coach has seen before. And so, um, but yeah, I think in scout, you know, this, those few actions, few tendencies here and there. Um, I, you know, if coaches don't want to post stats, I can watch a game in 10 minutes and know if this kid can shoot. Right. I mean, just as any good, any coach can look at a film and tell if a guy is good in mechanics, even on an off night, you can tell that kid can shoot. Right. Um, so those are probably the few things that Scott we look at. Definitely. I mean, it's better than college. We had a packet like in college of like <laughs> right. five, five pages, at least a pat in their picture there and everything. So, yeah. um, we try to dumb it down a little bit for high school though. Yeah. And did you understand it when you were in high school where how easily was it for you to understand the scout then? So, and this is the complete evolution, I think, of high school basketball. We didn't have – Huddle was not around right. yet. I think Huddle was only football back then. Mm -hmm. And so you had to go meet a coach in the parking lot with a CD in exchange and do the whole thing there. Compact disc. Yeah. It's a circle thing <laughs> put into a DVD or a computer, probably a computer back yep. then. Yep. And we could record stuff onto this disc, okay? And, Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, and that and that's the thing. It was just – my, 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 one of my coaches I still talk to that coached me was like, yeah, you had to meet someone off the five freeway with a CD that like, Hey, here is the film of this school. And so back then it was a lot hard. I think it was a lot more difficult because yeah. you had to do that. And so you might only have two games because back then you're filming with this, you got to download to this huddle. Mm -hmm. It's like exchange, ask, hopefully you, they'll say yes and give it to you. Right. But back then I think I understood it. Just because Jerry DeBusk was so, so into details, like his practices and his scout, I tell everyone to this day, he is one of the most detailed coaches I've ever seen in my life. It was just, there's drills we do now where I, I still remember it to this day, but it's like we covered, you cover everything in that one drill. And mm -hmm. so he was very, very, very scout oriented. And he had assistant coaches that I still talk to and their mentors me to this day that were so detailed. So I understood it not as a sophomore. Sophomore, I was over my head. No idea. <laughs> Let me go drop up. this twenty-five. Yeah. Real quick. <laughs> so yeah, sophomore, I was like, I'm just hoping to get on the floor and I'm going to shoot it when I'm open. But like junior, senior year, you you finally learn enough where you're like, okay, I get it. And so um, back then, it was definitely confusing at first. But I think I think scouting's a little not. It's easier to collect data now than back then. I think it was harder just because of the lack of resources. Hundred percent. And so yeah, let's talk about uh, after your sophomore year. So your first game of varsity, you dropped twenty five or something. Yeah. How's the rest of the sophomore year go? Um, and, and as a team, as uh, individually and as a team. Yeah. So we we ended up making playoffs. I ended up starting the rest of the year. Um, I had a couple pretty good games, but sophomore flow, you have up and down games. That's just I think that's normal with younger players. Mm -hmm. um, and then we lost in the CIF playoffs to Elsinore High School, mm -hmm. and they had a guy. I think his name. James Johnson, something Johnson, 6'10 guy with a 40 inch vert who went to Virginia. Whoa. And they had another guard, EJ Twyman, who was really good. Um, and so we lost to them. Um, but I mean, we did graduate a lot from the previous two years. We had Clay Thompson two years before that. We went to the CIF finals uh, the year after that, my freshman year, and we lost to Canyon, who had Chris Anderson, mm. one of the best point guards I've ever seen in person. Um, and so we made, we made it to, I think the third round, if I remember the third round, um, and we lost to Elsinore high school who was, they were good. I think they lost in the finals too, but, um, at SM, that was kind of the expectation though, is you make the third round. That's the expectation, yeah. um, at that school. So, um, it was, it was a fun sophomore year, but talk, it was just trial by trial by fire. I'm in there. I had one really good game and then I had another game where I'm six points, two for 14. And I'm just, you know, you have to learn to push through it and get over yeah. it and, and fight back through it. And I give my parents a lot of credit because there's games sophomore year where if I didn't play a lot or I played bad, I'm a sophomore. So I'm a, I'm a little emotional. I come yeah. in and I'm in the car and in and out, 
you know, drive through like eh, this, this is this, this, I'm not doing well. And it's my coach's fault. He's not doing this. And my mom would look at me and I said, figure it out. <laughs> and I was Thank like, you, <laughs> so she would look me in the eye and go, one, order your food Two, figure it out. Thank you. And Mrs. so Wood. thank you, Mr. And Mrs. Uh, Wood, yeah. for uh, doing the right thing as a parent. And, and so that's what, what does that do? What does that do? Right. Because parents want to blame the coach too or they want to find an excuse for their child for them not performing on a certain level and specifically for sophomores on varsity is such a tough spot to be mm -hmm. in because you have the upperclassmen who are yeah. more experienced and understand the system probably better than you and physically ready mm -hmm. versus someone who may be more talented and mm -hmm. good enough to play varsity but not ready to really throw it yeah. in there um it's it was it's a hard transition it's a super hard transition but my mom was really good about just, she, she just, one, she told me, and she was always big on like, you have to not pay your dues, but you have to develop into the product you want to be. You can't just, if you throw a product out there or you try to be the product out there and you're not ready, then it's only going to hurt you because then you're going to doubt your entire ability. Yes. And so that is something she made sure to let me know. And, it, and at that age, it's hard. Like, I, I can say this now at 29, like, yeah, I totally got it. But at 15, I'm like, this, this, this is not good. I don't <laughs> like this. But and then she also told me, if you really do want to play, make it where, and I'm sure this quote's been everywhere, make it where the coach has absolutely no choice but to keep you in the game. And so when I got my chance as a sophomore and I played really well, I made it where even if those guys got back from injury, you have zero choice but to keep me here. Yeah. And so it's a hard thing, but I think in general, and it's in all sports across the board, everyone in, in, in everyone looks at that little 5% they see on TV of like freshmen playing right away. Yes. Um, even in a high school game on ESPN or a college game, they don't understand the other 95% are guys that have to develop their, until their junior year right. to be a player. Right. And so I think they fixate on that 5% of, well, what about that guy? He's scoring 40 as a freshman. Well, yes, he's really good. Don't get me wrong. Hands down, really good. But there's ninety, there's probably 95% of other players that are working their way up. And they're going to probably, they're not going to catch them, but they're going to be in that conversation when they're juniors and seniors. Yes. And so I tell people, would you rather be in the conversation early or be in the end game conversation? I think you'd be in the end game conversation. And that's nothing against the guys that play as freshmen. Those guys are rightfully so right. deserving those time if they're you know produce, producing and everything. But there is countless kids that don't have that that aren't part of that five percent and on that so that not social media but the tv and the blast and the media that are working their way up and they're going to be that product that are there i i finished sm as an all i was an all league player two years in a row and an all cif player and i went through that five percent and i will say there was times where i was a sophomore and i that's when ball's life just kind of came out <laughs> but there was times where i'm watching sophomore sensation at some school in LA or, or San Diego. And I'm like, man, I could play with that guy. But then I waited, I waited and I got my opportunity and I finally caught up to that point. Right. Now I wasn't a high major D one player, but I got to that point where I produced at a good level. So yeah. I think that's the thing that parents have to understand is that 5% is a really, really small minority. And if you trust the 95% of kids that go through development of a program, yeah. they're going to reach that end goal. Man, preach it. Preach it, preach it, preach it. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, man, I've been saying this a lot on these last few episodes. Is I'm dealing with it a lot. We had a lot of good freshmen mm -hmm. that came through core that are in high school mm -hmm. now and they're on varsity yeah. and they're not understanding. Like, how do I get my coach? I need to get my work. Coach is not letting me. And it's like, just be patient. Be patient. You're really not ready. Yeah. Like you, do you want this responsibility? <laughs> we had a kid. Uh, we could talk. That's Dylan DePina. He's graduated years yeah. ago now, and he felt it as a freshman when we were, I was mm -hmm. coaching at Heritage Christian. Came in, he averaged 16 a year, freshman of the year. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. We're an open division team, right? Six seniors yeah. though. They all graduate the next year. All right, you were complaining about <laughs> them not passing you the ball and all yeah. these things. You're the man now. Mm -hmm. Oh, coach, are double teaming me. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you're the man yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, this is yours. This is what you wanted. Yeah. And it's a whole different game now. Mm -hmm. And so he had to adjust how he played yeah. and understanding that, oh, okay, these people who are older than me, playing more than me or whatever yes. it is, they're helping. Yeah. Like they're, they're actually helping me be who I am. And yeah. so that whole process is, is amazing, man. And yeah. it's, it's great to hear 
parents who said, hey, figure it out and let you go oh, through that she, adversity. Yeah. And, she and, said and, figure and it out all right. Yeah, she, <laughs> she definitely said figure it out. 100%. Okay, uh, so junior year, senior year, yeah. what was it? Uh, uh, junior, senior year, we, um, you know, my junior year, we, we actually didn't play that well. Um, we were, we made the playoffs, but um, I had a decent year, but that was, and I tell everyone too, this is another thing that players, I was transitioning into a like kind of fringe like starter, obviously, mm -hmm. and and if I had a good game, great. But that wasn't the expectation as a sophomore. Now it was I had to be good every game. Yes, and that was where the inconsistency start because I always tell players too, when you transition to a higher role, you are going to struggle at some point. It, it's it's very rare I think for players to just transition from being a role guy to the guy and just boom, take off and be the guy. And so I struggled a little bit. Um, I was an all league player and I had some, you know, we were young though. Once again, we were really young. We made it to the playoffs um, and we, I mean, once again though, when I say that we had an off year, we were like 10 and two going to Trinity League play. And then, you know, you, you just get beat by teams that are better. But um, to SM standards, we didn't have a great year. Yeah. And then um, I was an all league player there. We lost to Corona Del Mar in the first round, but they had a team, they had Marcus, Brad, not Marcus Bradley, I think, and he went to UCI. I think it was Marcus Bradley. And then mm -hmm. Danny Cheek, who went to NAU. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we just were, we were just yeah. overmatched. And actually, I was injured that year. I, I fractured my ankle Ooh. in three places at, at Servite. Ooh. And um, I, I'm, I was hard-headed, so I tried to tape up and play in the playoffs. <laughs> and um, I, I, I come in for five minutes, and this is when I knew, like, this is, I sub in and they know I'm hurt and their coach goes ISO one, four flat. And I'm, I'm on an Island with, with a bum leg and I, I got blown by so fast. And I just looked at coach and said, yeah, I got to come out the game. I can't do this, but I didn't want to let my team down though. Right, like right. I want to at least show I, I can play, I, I'm going to be out there. Um, and so that kind of happened. And then senior year, we had, um, we had a pretty good team. We, um, you know, once again, when we say we, we went two and eight in league, but we were, the four seed <laughs> playoff format was completely different back then. Right. Um, and so we were the four seed in division four. Um, and we had a pretty good team. I had a kid, a freshman on my team, my teammate, Joe Firstinger went to New Mexico, uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Um, he was on the, the TBT tournament this past year. So shout out Joe. Um, but we lost, we made it to the semis and we lost to Alemany and they were 20 top 25 in the country. They had Marquise Coleman, Max Gersey, Jericho Richardson. The state championship, year, 2012, yeah. They were unreal. Like, Man. we we played them and lost by 10 at their place. But the playoff format was so different back then. The final four in Division Four was us, Oak Park, when they had Rob, Rob Lee, Rob Lee, mm -hmm. Alemany, and St. John Bosco. That was the final four in Division <laughs> Four. So, <laughs> talk to competitive equity. They had it right, right. that year. Like, right, it was right. it was a crazy final four. Um, and we lost uh, to Alamany there, which I have no shame in saying they were just better. Like they were, they, they end were, up winning the, the championship. They were so well. good. They were yeah. so good. Um, but that year was great because I learned how to kind of lead a little bit that year. In terms of, I think my first three years, I did, I was just kind of getting by on. I'm just playing the play, and when I got into a leadership role, um, my I kind of had had the thought halfway through league. I have to get out of, out of myself and not play for myself. Mm. I have to play for the, the sake of my team. And I'm not saying I was selfish, but I think looking back at high school kids in general, like you want to do well and you kind of have it for yourself a little bit. And I think right before playoffs, I kind of had that thought and I was talking even to my coaches and they were telling me like, if we want to go far, you got to be the most selfless point guard. And I finally was, I think it finally hit me like, you know what? I got to do that. I got to have, I got to make my teammates better, even yeah. better, you know? And from there, I was even our leading scorer the first couple of games. I was trying to get everyone involved and guys, my teammates were stepping up and hitting shots and they were stepping into that moment. And it's, it sucks. Cause in hindsight, I think I should have done that earlier, but you know, hindsight's 2020, but that's one thing I think players like once you kind of release that self thought and you become selfless. And, I, and, and I've even tried to tell my guys, like, be the most selfless player. My game got better, and everyone else's game got better. And I think it's hard because you are you think it's a risk. But when I finally saw it, I was like, okay, this this is actually what it really meant. 
I mean, so we made it, we made a run that I was proud of. I mean, we, we made it to the semis, um, and, and just lost to a better team. We play and we played them probably closer than most, but who, who was that? Alameda. That was Alameda. 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 Yeah, I lost yeah, Alameda yeah, by yeah. 10. Oh yeah. And, and so like I left the, like we left the game, like there was no like, oh, we're sad. I'm like, yeah, we, we got beat. <laughs> like we're we're that sad happened. we're sad I'm sad my career is over but at least I lost to someone that I can look back and be like they beat us they were yeah. just better yeah. um, and so that was kind of the the high school finish but I finished as a two time all league player I was an all CIF player and I was an all state um, honor, honorable mention so wow. it was it was a cool way to finish my career coming from being that freshman basketball player to finishing as with with those accolades too yeah I want to go back to you talking about being selfless um, you touched on it and I think it's how, how, I don't want to say this. It's crazy how when you are selfless, it brings you more. Yeah. And that's the hard part for us to understand. Yeah. The only way you find that out is by being selfless. Yes. And the earlier you do it, the easier it's going to be. The less, yeah. less stress you're going to have on yourself. Yeah. So what are you, how are you coaching that with somebody who you can tell is elite? and has the ability to score and kind of mm -hmm. take things in their own hands that can come have a positive outcome, but how that selflessness will have a more positive outcome long term. I think it's just, you got to harp it every day and you just have to keep, you have to practice it too. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think people call it servant leadership. And so I, I, I'm not perfect by any means and no coach is, but I think I try to just before every talk and our keys of the game, we can play the best team in the state, or the worst team in the state. It's going to be on their keys of the game selfless. Can you be selfless on both ends? Can you be a selfless mm. teammate? Um, you know, we've watched a lot of, uh, we kind of dipped into the more sports psychology this year for our program in terms of, we talked about selfless body language. Can you hang your head high and your shoulders out, your chest out? Can you, um, you know, we talked about, we, we, I showed him a video where we even broke it down to a, a biological aspect. He said, you release oxytocin by giving half fives by giving this. So we, we tried to break that down. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because they're high school kids and they joke about it. You know, at first they're, they're joking and think it's funny. And, but then they realize like the players were like, Oh, we're actually like high fiving more. And, and we're kind of like vibing with each other more. And so I try to introduce that. Mm -hmm. Eventually you're going to have to look in the mirror and just, you have to release that self. Yeah. But I try to put little tools and little activities in front where it's like, Hey, watch this video. They, they saw that most playoff teams lead the NBA in half fives. I think it was the, the Suns one year or Steve Nash led yep. it one year. And so we try to do those. We try to do, you know, keep your chest out. I'll call a timeout just to be like, hey, our body language isn't that good. I won't even have a board in front of me. Our body language is not that good. We need to be a little bit higher with our body language. And I think that will translate more into being selfless. If you can keep harping on those things, eventually there's two things that are going to happen. Either you don't do it and you're the outlier. Mm. Or because most of them will do it, so you end up not doing it, and you're the outlier, and you're going to go elsewhere, or you buy into it, and you start seeing your personal success. It's hard because you you think that you don't see the vision ahead of you, and so you think you're taking a gamble, or coach is just saying this to say this. But I try to connect them that I did it personally. Like I had to release myself from being a little bit selfish in high school, and that's when I started seeing success as a team, not just me as a team. Yeah. I started seeing my players hit shots that I probably didn't think in the beginning of the year they weren't going to do. And so I try to just incorporate a lot of what I learned and just show them, you know, kids are visual, so I'll show them videos, I'll show them this, and maybe one video they connect with it more, and maybe one video they're like, this is not, I don't like this. So we try to do little exercises and, and talk more amongst each other. I'll have film session and I even go over games sometimes. We'll just go over this and I'll write on the board, what does this sit with you? Mm. And so we try to do a little more activities to build that sports psychology side of releasing the self part and being selfless. That's awesome. And did you develop all that or where do you get all these ideas from? Um, part of it was I was a visual person. And so I think growing up, I used to watch videos and take away, whether it was even highlights, like I would just take right. away from it. And so I know kids are visual. I know everyone has a different learning style, but most kids I feel are visual. And so I think... Part of it was from what I saw and what coaches have done with me in the past, but part of it I think too was just learning kids' as learning te techniques and understanding most kids are visual. Some yeah. kids aren't. TikTok. They, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, yeah TikTok. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so those are probably the, the ways I, I kind of adapted that into it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's dope. I'm, I'm going to steal some of that. Um, <laughs> used from middle school. Um, 
recruiting, what was the recruitment like uh, through high school? So I know the injury probably slowed you down a bit. Yeah. Um, what, how, how did that impact your game fully first? And then we'll hop into the recruitment. I did not get recruited after I got injured. I did not have any offers leaving high school. Wow. And I actually took a year off high school. Uh, not high school. Took a year off school. And um, I wanted to, like I said, I didn't have anything. And I got into schools to go to school. But I think I wanted to, if I wanted to stay home at least then. And um, I gray shirted actually, gray shirted, or I just worked out with the team or whatever. But I was taking classes at IBC because my mom's like, you have to take classes. Like you're not, she wanted me to get a degree. I promise her I get a degree. She goes, you have to take classes. So I took classes and would just like lift with the team. Um, and then um, I was working a job. Like had the real world hit. I worked yeah. the job. My first job was Target. I was a mm. car attendant at Target. And I told her, I joke around. I said, I was a 24 hour fitness person. I was a 24 hour fitness regular <laughs> working on my game. I was lifting, mm. but I had no, no offers. No, no. I had some recruitment my junior year, but getting hurt kind of hinders that. Um, and I, and, but at the end of the day, that's not, that's no, that's reality. That's just a reality. And, and that I wasn't sitting there bitter, like at schools, but it was a reality. Um, and I also wasn't familiar with other levels. I think just my sister had letters from D1 since eighth grade. So I wasn't familiar with D2, D3, NAI. Wow. I didn't really know. Like I got letters from them, but I, I didn't know. I didn't know where Occidental was. Uh, you know, I played them now when I was, you yeah. know, but I didn't know where those schools were. So I didn't really like pay attention to that. And so I took a year off, just worked out, um, played a lot of pickup. And I think that helped me was just, I played pickup religiously, which I don't think kids do enough nowadays to right. play pickup, but I was a religious pickup player. And then um, a buddy in mine, a buddy and myself, we went to a open gym at La Sierra University in Riverside. And we were just going because we heard there was hoop there and we went. And I played well and coach called me in the office and offered me a scholarship <laughs> out of open gym. Oh, man. And I just came in and my whole thing was just the pickup culture, like true pickup game culture was just I'm not going to get beat because there's a three game wait. <laughs> so I was just like, I was playing defense because I want to wait. Like if yeah. I wait, I get cold and stiff and I don't yeah. want to, you know, so I was playing hard. I was playing, you know, how, you know, and coach the bus taught me the right way. So I'm still playing that way. And coach Robbins had me, um, offered me a scholarship and I was like, it's in Riverside, which is not far. You take 241. And mm -hmm. I was like, I guess I'm playing college basketball. <laughs> like wow. I just, so, um, ended up there. Um, and that was an, it's an NAI. And that's what I really learned about, and like NAI is a different animal. I think people do not look into NAI enough, yeah, um, because there's no age limit. Wow. So my teammates were, I think our oldest teammate was 31. Grown man. And I'm 19. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I never heard uh, of a 31 year old playing college. Oh yeah, no, yeah, it's NAI. It's a lot of those, and they're good players though. They right, all have right. a different story, different route. But yeah. um, I went to La Sierra. Um, and so just for kids, though, in general, they have to look at those options because NAIA, in my opinion, is like Division Two. Oh, for sure. It's divi like there are guys there that are bounce backs from D1s, yes. bounce backs from, from these schools. And so, um, and everyone just has a different story. There was a player that was an All-American, but maybe something happened in life. He had to take time off. He has now time to go back to college and wants to get his degree. He's playing basketball. Yeah. And so I tell kids all the time, you have to look at NAI. It is not a, a uh, frowned upon to play NAI yes. basketball because it's just, it's unbelievable hoops. And, and you know, you got to play. We, we played, you know, D1 schools that year. We played um, Division II schools that year. And so um, my freshman year, though, was interesting. That, that was a, that was truly an interesting experience. Uh, to say the least. <laughs> what, why so? Just the, um, how it happened or in the season? In the well? season. So um, in the season, I ended up, I got there and I ended up starting and I was our second league scorer. And I was our, I was Cal Pack freshman of the year. I was first team all conference as a freshman. Um, but we played, we played Northridge. We played CSUN, LMU, hmm. uh, Cal Poly Pomona. Um, I mean, I felt like we played a, a, a top school every other game. Hope International and Concordia and, and those schools. And I think, like I said, I, wasn't, I was not familiar with these schools. I knew Concordia because it was down the street from my house in Orange right. County. But we were playing, and I'm like, whoa, these guys are really good. And so it was really fun. You know, we didn't have the greatest year in terms of winning and losing. 
And so, um, but just kind of getting thrown and talk about thrown in the fire. I just, I didn't know any better about college, but that's yeah. where I learned. And for kids to understand NAI level hoops is really good hoops. That's college basketball. It's college basketball, which I, I looked the other day, 3.5 of kids play college sports period because of the portal. Now yes. high school kids to college is 1% now because of the portal. So like it's one well, percent three point five percent to one percent because of the play portal. NCAA basketball. Now yeah, yeah, you yeah, no, for yeah, sure. You but play still it. yeah absolutely. that's what everybody's striving for. That means ninety nine percent of high school students do not play division one basketball. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, I gotta it's, update my facts. <laughs> what we I always promote this and I try to do this. Mm -hmm with our middle school students is to go see every level of basketball while you're in middle school. Mm -hmm. So you understand when you get to high school and you know, you're, you're we all strive to be a division one mm -hmm. player. We all strive to go to the NBA, all mm -hmm. of us. Like that's yeah. literally what we do, but understanding the opportunity to play and the, it's there and you can have fun and be an all American and all leagues, yeah. <laughs> all those things. Yeah. And, have an opportunity to even play pro basketball after mm -hmm. that. Like the opportunities are endless. The networking, the yeah. education, the free education that you get, um, all those things are there on every level. So go look at an NAIA game, yes. a Division three game, Please. a Division two game, Division one game, and a junior college game. Yes. And while you're at it, go watch a prep school <laughs> and see and see yeah. what is in front of you. Like how many people you have to be. You have to be better than ninety nine percent of people now. Yeah, and and it's just too like if. You know, when kids, it's funny, there'll be kids that, um, I'll play at 24 Hour Fitness sometimes, and there'll be kids that come in there, and um, there'll be guys that come back from break, you know, college yeah. break, and they're playing, and the kids are like, that guy's so good, he has to be playing in a D1. And they'll be like, no, I played D3 in, in Washington or yeah. Oregon. I tell the kids, it's no joke. Junior college even, no joke. No joke. <laughs> like, no joke. I, I can't, like, every level is no joke. And so yes. I think people just look so differently upon that, but... I learned just because at NAI, you, I, I played against every level of college being at an NAI because you're either the buy game for a D1 mm -hmm. or you're playing a D3. The, only, the, di the main difference I learned as a player is really post players. There's so many guards in high school basketball. Every guard in college is really good or probably was a, a factor on their team. So yeah. the difference is the post player in D3 is 6'6". Six, six, where the post player in D1 is 6'10 and can jump out the gym. Right. You know, that's the difference. The guards are all really good. My yeah. my, my teammates, you know, the leading scorer at La Sierra was Davion Woods. He was really good. Mm. And, and he was a guard at Centennial as like a six man. And so um, it's just things like that. Like the guard plays really good and top notch across the board. It's really just the post players that make it difference in D1, D2, D3, and yeah. AI. Absolutely. No, I love that. And so what happens after your freshman year? So um, I, this is pre-portal, so, you know, <laughs> pre-portal, there, there's no entering the portal. It's, you know, I, I had a successful year, but I wanted to win. And we only, we didn't win a lot of games that first year. And so I wanted to win. And that's the biggest thing with me is I, I hate losing more than I like winning. Mm. And so I wanted to win. And so I, I put my, you know, I got my release from La Sierra and um, sent it out to colleges. And I, and I had good numbers, you know, um, for that. Um, and so I uh, got picked, I guess you say picked up, it's funny how that works. You but entered the uh, I, portal yeah, the, that didn't exist. I, I, <laughs> I got um, a scholarship to Arizona Christian University for Jeff Rudder. Um, Brandon Dunson actually recruited me, who is at Stanford now, wow. one of the coolest guys ever, one of the greatest coaches uh, that I've been, been with. And uh, Arizona Christian was, that's GSAC NAI. So now that's like high level, I compare it to high level D2. Yeah. I mean, I see every other year. Low level division one almost. Yeah. They, yeah. I, I think the year before I got there, they beat NAU at NAU by 20. Yeah. And so I was like, whoa, like, okay. And I get there, and this is when I think I was really exposed to just how competitive college basketball is because we had guys, I had teammates, oh, where'd you get recruited from? Oh, Oklahoma. Oh. What <laughs> like about the you? University of. Yeah. I was like, what about you? <laughs> well, I was a target for a year and. Worked out at twenty four. Yeah, I got picked up at twenty four. Yeah, but, <laughs> but um, we had really good players, and 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 just it was high level basketball. And that and and now we went from playing, you know, some low major D ones and by games. We went to BYU. We mm. went to New Mexico State. We played Pascal Siakam when he was at New Mexico State. Did not know him at the time, but that guy was giving us the absolute work. <laughs> um, 
And so I played for, for two years there for, for Coach Rudder. And I tell everyone to this day, Coach Rudder is probably one of the best X's and O's offensive coaches I've seen. He had a, he, his actions were really good, and we were very up-tempo. Um, and we went to first year that we were there, I think we were 10th in the country, maybe a little bit lower. My second year, we were fourth in the country. Whoa. And so we were, yeah, we were good. And, and that conference was, was Hope, Biola, Vanguard, Westmont, William Jessup just entered the GSAC um, and Masters, uh, Masters, yeah. and they had a guy, Russell Bird, who came back from uh, Michigan State. So we had the guard guys like that. Um, and I tell them from GSAC, oh, you're just man. you're playing guys that are just good. Um, and, and I was a role player there. And, and that was totally fine just mm-hmm. because I wanted to win. Yeah. And I wanted to impact winning. Yeah. And so whether it was me scoring 20, I wanted to impact winning. Man. And so um, I was there for two years. And I just, I just had really good. We went to the NAI tournament, which is unreal. Like, Played in Kansas, or is it? It's Kansas yeah, City? Kansas City. Yeah. yeah, and I know the Hall of Fame. I think is there the College Basketball yeah. Hall of Fame. Yes. So that that whole center, but that atmosphere is just unreal. Yeah. Like we're playing the Georgetown colleges, the the Pikevilles, and San Marcos was an NAI at the time, and they were top five in the country. So it just was such a cool experience playing that high caliber of basketball. Um, you know, and, and so it was really cool. I played two years there. We had, had a lot of success as a team, and I, I you know, met a lot of really good players yeah. that were really good. And I, as a role guy, I had the guard guys that were just really good, really, really good. And I think at that time, I took a little for granted how good those guys were and how much they got me better. Um, but it was really cool. It was such a cool experience. But that was, that was like high D2, low-level D1 kind of talent. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was cool. It was a great experience at Arizona Christian, but I, um, you know, I wanted to come home. I got a little homesick, so I just wanted mm-hmm. to come home. And Why so? I think just, I, I don't think kids understand when you're on the road in college and it's not for everyone, yeah. but you know, you're, you're in the dorms by yourself, winter break by yourself. You can't go home unless it's for like one Christmas day. Right. And so, you know, you're, you're homesick and I wanted to be closer to home and, like college is when you get to college, it's a job. It's a job, you know, especially like the high level play. It's a job. And I don't think kids, that's my advice when kids go to college is it's a job, you know? So you, you have to be invested all the time because that is your job. That is your expectation. And so I think I just got a little too, it was just too, it was a lot. It was a lot for me. I I can openly admit that it was just a lot for me, especially I think just like working my way up to that that it was just a lot. And so you endured um, two years though. I mean, it's not like, yeah, no, not like you yeah. were there like, Hey, I was there for a month and I got out. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> you endured it, for two, two years. And... Yeah. And, and, and like I said, met some great people there. I just think it was a lot for me at that time. And I think I was at NAI. I think you have to have a level of maturity and I think I was still fairly young. So I think I just mat- like just physical maturity, mental maturity. I don't think I was very, I was there yet. And I can self-assess myself to know that. Yeah. And so I think that that's why I came back home and wanted to come back home and um, finish up at, at Cal Lutheran University. Nice. So, which, yeah, that was, I loved Cal Lutheran, though. It was great, too. Though. Yeah, so how was that? Just your, your senior year, you, all this experience playing at different levels and, um, you know, the, probably a, a more mature, better, per, better version of yourself. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So, yeah, I came to Cal Lutheran and... Um, we had Rich Ryder was the coach there for 20, 20 plus years. It feels like a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And I get to Cal Lou and I have one amazing coaches there. Um, Brendan Garrett coaches at Camarillo right now. And he was actually my assistant coach playing, coaching me. Okay. And so kind of crazy that you we're in the same. Him, yeah. <laughs> um, but Jeff, it was, the story is still funny to me. So Rich Ryder, 20 year guy at Cal Lou. Um, and we get there and... I actually, before that, I wasn't going to play. I just was going to go to Kyle and finish my degree. I think at that time I felt mentally burnt out. Mm-hmm. But Coach Garrett kind of talked me into it. You come play. Come come, just do open runs. So we, there was open runs at Moore Park, and I was playing. And I think I kind of got that spark back to want to play. Um, and then first game, we played an exhibition game. Coach Ryder comes in, and, and anyone that knows Coach Ryder, he has this, this voice and tone. And he's, he's an older guy, but he's fun. And we win that game. We're excited. And Coach Ryder comes in and goes, all right, guys, I'm retiring. And we're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, we just want first game of the year. He's like, I'm retiring. Coach Danes, you're, you're the interim. You're in charge. Like, I don't, I don't know if he told Coach Danes before that. But, like, even Danes was like, wait, what? Like, you know. 
But I know why he did that. He wanted to give Danes that opportunity because he was his assistant for a long time to lead the team. Mm-hmm. And so um, he retired after game one and <laughs> Coach Danes was in charge. And, and we ended up, uh, I think we were 20 and five that year. Nice. Uh, made it to the conference championship. And we had a really fun team. I had, you know, we had some, it was a blend of transfers. We had Adrian Francis from ABC. He was a really good guard. Um, Caleb Ritchie, um, full circle, played me my freshman year when he was at another college. Now we're teammates. One of the best point guards I've ever seen in my life as a player. Um, And we had a lot of other good players, but those two were were really good players. And that team just gelled so much chemistry-wise. And it was so fun because in D3, I've learned it's as hard, it's, it's as serious as you want it to be. And I mean that in a good way is if you want to be a pro, you can go D3 and be a pro. They have all, right. all the resources. If you're going and you, you're good at basketball, but you kind of just want to play, like it kind of can give you that avenue too. Um, I know Russell White right now has them playing on Unreal right now, but at that time, it was fun. And we were averaging 80 some points a game or oh, something like that. Like we were up fun. tempo and, and, and it was just really fun. But Coach Danes was was such a good coach to finish my my college career in, just mm-hmm. because he kind of knew the background I had going through. So he was he was big on checking up on me. Hey, you good? And you know, I was older at that time. It's funny, like twenty four was considered being really old in in college basketball. But right. you know, back then, you know, they're making <laughs> fun of me for being old. But I'm like, okay. But it was really cool. It was really fun. Um, and so I had a great experience, and I finished yeah. um, I finished as an all, all conference player. Um, for them, I was our leading scorer, but we also, I mean, our offense, we had four guys in double figures. So it wasn't like I was carrying the load. We had really good players. Yeah. Um, and then I, I tell everyone the pitch about Skyac basketball is they take the top players from that conference and they go overseas after the end of every season and they have them try out like they do a tour. Oh, really? They do a tour and try out overseas. And Whoa. so we went to Iceland and Denmark and played awesome experience. I personally wanted to go to travel, but you, you went know. to another country for basketball. Yeah. And it was really fun. And and I had opportunities from that, but mm-hmm. I, 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 I knew like, I knew halfway through league, I'm done playing after this. <laughs> like I, I wanted to travel and play, but, yeah. and I had the opportunities in front of me, but I just knew, I remember sitting there at Chapman and I came out the game and I was kind of coaching it from the bench a little bit. And I looked, I go, yeah, I'm not playing. This is what I want to do. And so mm-hmm. that kind of segued into coaching. And the one thing too, I will tell kids is the, the, the one danger of transferring and it has nothing to do with basketball is if you don't look at your courses, you fall behind so fast in yeah. class. Like I, I was a good student, but there's a different course load for this school and this school. Yes. I went from Arizona Christian and I had a 3.8 and I was a good student. I went to Kowloon. And I had, I fell behind another whole like year. So I had to finish school. Almost 30 units didn't count. Exactly. Just because it's different. You know, Arizona Christian's a religious school. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But Kalu doesn't really have that requirement. So they don't count those as credits yeah. towards graduating. So I had to go back and finish more school um, okay. after I'm playing, which sucks because I'm sitting there in the stands like as a student. And I'm like, man, I just played here last year. And I have to, <laughs> <laughs> like, I got to watch the student. game. I gotta, it's not fun. Like, yeah. um, but that's the one advice too for college kids. If you do mm-hmm. transfer, it's not, it's nothing wrong with that, but you do have to look at the academic side because you could fall behind really fast. Right. So right. that's no. that's probably my pitch for transferring if you do. Yep. No, it's always something we bring up. Uh, many people who have sat in this chair have, we've discussed this over and over, the importance of checking the academic side, especially when you're in high school. Even yeah. this happens to high school players who aren't taking NCAA uh, accredited core courses that they need to even get into a yeah. Division One school if they want to, or a Division Two school. But uh, especially when you're playing on those lower levels, it differs by state. It differs yes. by uh, levels. So D3 is yeah. not NAIA. They're different for a reason. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Because of the academic standard that those mm-hmm. schools hold, yeah. not just the level of basketball play. Yeah. So no, thank you for explaining yeah. that. And um, <laughs> Good. So you finished your degree, though, I while did. you're at Calu. I did. And you knew... so. When did you know you were going to coach? Was it that moment against Chapman? I think or? that that moment got me interested. Okay. And then I like I said, having coming back from your I think being out there in Europe and playing those games out there, I kind of was like, I could do this, but the and, and like I said, the opportunities were there, the, the contracts were there, but 
I realized, and this is like, I think some people have to have a self-assessment. I looked and I said, am I willing to wake up every day and do multiple workouts a day to be a pro? Because if you're going to be a pro, you have to put in the pro work, working out seven days a week or six days a week. Yes. And I was honest with myself and said, I'm not going to want to do that. I'm not. I just, I want to be around basketball, but I don't want to get up every day, do two, three workouts, do this workout, do this, bot, you know, recover your body this way, the wear and tear. I didn't want to do it. And, 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 and I just was like, that's fine. But I wanted to stay around basketball because I, I do love the game. I love playing. Like I'll go play pickup every, you know, couple times a week just to stay. I'm about to pick up for my men's league. You sound like you still hoop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, I, I like doing that, but to be a pro, it's just a next level standard that I just, I was honest with myself. I don't want to do, I, you know, and, yeah. and, and, you know, and it's not like I got Spain's a league, you know, contract with this much money. <laughs> right. Like I'm going to have to work from the C league of this country and yeah. bounce around. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just knew I, it was not for me. Right. <laughs> so, no, it's perfect. um, I knew in Europe, I, I was playing, but I think I was more coaching during the game while I was playing too. Like uh, yeah. we're running a break and I'm like, Hey, go over there, <laughs> go, go this way, go set this screen. And but I loved the, the trip was amazing though. Iceland and Denmark are one of the most beautiful countries. Um, no, what amazing. I went to loved it. I love where <laughs> basketball can take you. I love it. Uh, so transitioning into coaching. So your first coaching job is where, how did that happen? Yeah. So Newberry park, uh, Newberry park high school. Um, uh, I had to finish my degree and I had to work cause I wasn't mm -hmm. playing anymore. And so I was emailing all types of high schools nearby. I was like, do you need a freshman coach? I was like, do you want, do you need a freshman coach or, you know, JV assistant? I just, I, my mom was like, you need to work if you're gonna be in school. And I didn't want to like go do an actual, I didn't want to go right. work somewhere. Right. And so, uh, Matt Eichinger reached back out to me and it was his first year at Newberry park. And he wanted me to help with his varsity team. And I, I, and, and I know he, he's one of the bit, like he is one of the most underrated coaches that I've worked for. Um, but it was so fun that first year because it was his first head coaching job. It was my first coaching job. So I think we were both just kind of like, let's just have fun. And, and, and we had a, we were blessed to have a returning group at Newberry of good players. Like we had a Chapman guy, guy went to Chapman, Daniel Folds, Matt Solomon is now playing at Warner Pacific. Like we had a solid team. Yeah. And so we had a good foundation and we kind of just winged it, but it was fun. Like it was mm -hmm. super fun. It was super, you know, he was very detail oriented. So I was, I grew up detail oriented. So we were able to kind of blend that and we just had a good time. You know, we, our first year we won, you know, 19 or 20 games and went to the playoffs and, and it was, you know, really in the Marmonte league and that's a tough league. Right. And so it was just really cool that first year to like, I wouldn't have wanted to work for anyone else as a first year and working for Ike. Um, and we had a lot of fun coaches on that staff too, where it was just super, it wasn't laid back, but we had fun with it because there was no expectation, I guess, yeah. being our first job. So we just, we were, we were just having fun. Like we were just having fun with it and we're going to go play this team and do this and no one's expecting us to win. And next thing you know, we're winning games. And so I, I my first year, my only year at Newberry, it holds dear just because, you know, Matt Eichinger is one of my close, I went to his wedding when he got mm -hmm. married and he was so, such a good first coach to coach under because he, he treated me also with that level of respect knowing that I played and it wasn't like he was bossing me around. It was, he had me as a, I was a peer with him. Yeah. And so, um, I think that was super important. I love that, um, that first year at Newberry. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And did you know at that point you wanted to eventually be a head high school coach or what was the goal then? Or was it like, Oh, I just had to get a job. So I'm not working regular. <laughs> so I'm just going to do basketball. I think it made me want to coach more, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a head coach because there were times where I, I think would test me. And we'd be up big in a game and goes, all right, would stand up. You're in charge. And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm up there like, uh, you know what time out, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so like, it was just, he would put me in positions I think to see, and I think I got more comfortable. And then in like the summer he, or spring, he had me coach the group a little bit. So I don't think at first I knew, yeah. but in time, I think he saw that I had the potential to be. And so he put me in situations where I think in the beginning I was nervous. But then I was like, okay, I, I, I feel a little more comfortable as time went on. Awesome. So what was your next job? So you're there only for a year, right? Only for a year. Yes. And so then um, I got my degree and... Congratulations. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Santa Margarita. Uh, Santa Margarita. I went back to my alma mater and it, Jerry retired actually when I was a senior. So Jeff Reiner was the coach there. Yeah. How that happened was 
I never experienced a SM modern day game as a alumni non-player. Hmm. Like I didn't really go back after I graduated, not because I didn't want to, but it's just, College. I didn't live yeah, in, you're yeah. Right on, yeah. So finally, I think we had a day off and I was like, I'm gonna go watch SM modern day play. And I went and the atmosphere was insane. Like, I think as a player, you see it one way and as, as an alumni, I'm like, man, there's a lot of people here. And I come back and Jeff finds me after the game and Jeff, you know, we're talking and I'm like, yeah, I got into coaching. And then Jeff, you know, so when are you gonna come back here? And I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> didn't know you wanted me to come back. And, and, and Jeff was like, no, you need, you need to come back. And so, um, you know, graduating, I, I, I was able to kind of move back and, and I went back to, to Santa Margarita. And first of all, Jeff is one of the coolest guys one of the real he's a really good coach and that first year was was unbelievable um just i tell everyone as an assistant you kind of have to pay your dues too and and it's not like you're you're not the first lead guy making the calls right away right like i remember jeff had jeff was having me do stuff you know you need to go do this you need to go film this game you need to go do this and i remember at first i'm thinking like man i was just with coach heikinger and we're we're here and and <laughs> At first, I didn't understand. I think I was 24 at the time, or 23, 24. And some coaches left. You know, situations happened when coaches left. And, and all of a sudden, he's like, I need you to step in and be like, you need the coach in these games. Mm. Also, he didn't tell me, you need to practice with these guys too. Because he's like, you just played, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay, you're going to practice. And he gave me a practice jersey sometimes. He goes, you're on the white team today, coach. And I'm like... You're to scout. Yep. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, so... Um, we get there in that first year. We had Jake Kyman with UCLA, Max Ogmanpolo, USC. Oh gosh, Big Lee, Oregon State. So here I am trying to guard Jake Kyman and Max, and I'm you know, I'm in shape, but like I, I I'm well rem I'm removed from playing. So yeah. like there's like in shape of yeah I play here and there and I lift at the gym, but I'm not in like college yeah. high school shape. Weekend Warrior shape. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So you know we had a, a we had a really good team. Yeah, and. I'm in there in practice just like, you know, getting gas. But it was great. It was super fun. Um, that year taught me so much. I, my, my mom would tell me that it was like a master's program on how to coach. Mm. Because Jeff just, he made me learn so much. And I was so, and, and I conjured it too. But obviously at the training league level, it's just like a whole new level of, of prep. Yeah. I remember when you guys played Crespi that year. Yes. At Crespi. Yes. Man, I was very impressed with the coaching. It, and it was that schedule that year. I tell people to this day, Jeff Jeff would joke. He's like, oh, I wonder who scheduled this. And I said, dude, this is this schedule is insane. <laughs> we That year we played. And Jeff, and I love Jeff's mentality. We'll play anyone anywhere. And this is before prep schools were not allowed to play high schools. Right. We played Rancho Christian twice with both Moby brothers. Our opening scrimmage was Sierra Canyon with Cassius. We played Bishop Gorman, Oak Hill Academy, Wasatch Academy, Modesto Christian. Oh my um, gosh. There was a point in, in the season where we played, I think it was Modern Day Wednesday, Bishop Gorman Friday, Nike Extravaganza, Oak Hill Academy Saturday. And we then we went and played Coronado. How'd you do all those three games? We beat Bishop Gorman. All right. Well, <laughs> all right. As long as you got the dub, we're good. Uh, but, but it was like... Coronado, we played Coronado at Coronado that had Pop Pop Isaacs and Jaden Hardy. Mm. You know, we played Oak Hill Academy, had Cam Thomas and, and uh, I saw that game Cole too. Anthony. Oh, I saw that game too. And Cole and, Anthony was a little injured that game with the ankle. A little, Cam, little. He's, Tom, Cam Thomas went. Oh, that's, a, that's why I saw Cam. I was like, he's a pro. I was like, it was, a, he was only a sophomore. It was funny though. We're looking at I'm like, who has 30? I go, who's Cam Thomas? <laughs> like, we're looking around like, who is this guy? He's 32 <laughs> yeah. points. And, and, and that schedule was so hard, plus the Trinity League. Um, and so we ended up being uh, CIF Division One. We were on the open watch, and then we lost one to Jay Sarah, who still had a good team. DJ Rodman was on that team. Yep. I think um, Martinez was on that team. Ian Martinez, I think, was mm -hmm. on that team. Still a really good team. We lost to them. We went down to Division One, which uh, is still a really good division. Yeah. But I think that schedule prepped us so much because we, we were prepared yeah. in that playoff run. We played Edison High School, Crespi, Harvard Westlake, Damian, Chino Hills when they had Big O. And, and I, here I am trying to clip, you know, Jeff's like I had to scout. Like I was in charge of kind of like scouting and defensive call, personnel. And I told him this day that story. We played Chino Hills in the finals 
with big O. And here I am thinking, I got a foolproof plan. We're going to do this. We're going to double the post. Like you, you talk yourself up like, oh yeah, it's going to be really good. He had 30 <laughs> and like 15 rebounds. And Coach Ryan was looking at me and I said, I thought it would work. Okay. Like I didn't say it was a foolproof plan, but I thought it would work. It was it, a plan. It was a plan, but just, you know, I had to learn how to scout for him. Johnny Juzang at Harvard Westlake, you know, Crespi had Kyle Owens and a pretty good team that year. Yeah. Um, Damien had uh, Malik Thomas. It's just that year alone was just a absolute crash course on how to coach. Yeah. And so I was there for that year and we won CIF that year and we lost in the regional finals to Etiwanda. I think they had Jalen Clark might have been there that year. Yeah, that was there. Yeah. They yeah. Yeah. They took Clamp City to a whole new level that year. Mm-hmm. Um and then uh Coach Reiner uh went to College of Center, Idaho. He he left. And so I was kind of in that weird crossroads of I don't know what to do. Um, I was kind of too inexperienced to like go attack and be any head coach anywhere. And so um, I, I stayed because you know, I went there and it was comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Coach Bell came in. So once again, Coach Reiner, who was a college coach, left to college. Here comes Coach Bell, who is a college coach. So I had the beauty of play, coaching under two college yeah. coaches. And um, that year we were really, I mean, we graduated everyone from the CIF team. So, but we still, we were, I think a game under 500. But we played a hard schedule and still challenged ourselves. But um, Coach Bell taught me. I think I learned – Jeff was a really good offensive coach, and I learned a lot of, like, actions and offense from him. And then Coach Bell was a very good defensive coach, is a very good defensive coach. So I learned a lot on the defensive end of the expectation on defense. Nice. And so it was cool you to kind of like get – Like you said, a master's degree, man. Yeah, and, and so, you know, being in that kind of environment and seeing that and then – having such high level players, I was able to like see college coaches come in and pick their brain because they're recruiting Max, they're recruiting Jake, they're recruiting Big Lee, you know, so I was able to pick their brains, you know, hey, what do you guys do here? What do you do here? And so I think that two years felt like 12 years just because it was just such high level hoops around me that helped build that. And so that was my two years at at Santa Margarita. Um, I was, like I said, it's, it's hard to win a ring in general. So I'm fortunate to have one of those as an assistant, but those were fun. Those were fun. Training league basketball, it's a whole nother level, and I loved it. I loved it, absolutely. Awesome. And it prepared you for where you are now. And so yeah. how'd the opportunity at St. Bonaventure come? So, uh, and you're just going from coast to coast, right? Uh, like, I know. <laughs> that, 101, I, that 101 owes me a lot of money on the 101 freeway. But um, <laughs> the job opened up. Uh, Pat Frank was the coach before me, and he resigned, and he did a good job. They, they won, a, I think, five league titles or so. Um, and so Pat Frank resigned and I didn't know, I knew, I knew of St. Bonaventure for football because we played them in high school in football a lot because they were, they were the team. And so I didn't know much about their basketball program and the job opened up and I wanted to be a head coach, but I wanted to go somewhere that had some athletic foundation. Didn't have to be basketball, but just an athletic foundation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Pat Frank resigned. I think I saw it on Twitter or there was like a newspaper, uh, press thing from the VC star. And so I emailed AD and said, you know, I applied. It's my first ever application for a head coaching job. And, um, I got called in to interview and it was kind of during COVID time. So once again, this is a very weird situation. Um, just because you don't know if you're going to have a season next year, even if I did get hired. And so, um, I got interviewed for it. And I remember they called me back for the second interview. And I remember it was within like a week. The second drive, I go, man, I just drove up here an hour and a half. More. Can we, I better can get we do this, this on Zoom? I was like, like, I better get this job. I just drove two hour and a half drives and back in, in a week. But um, I got hired uh, by, by – um, I had a great administration interview. And, and my AD at the time, John Moeller and uh, Raul Camacho, they were great in that process. And the, the thing that I liked was – and I was honest. I said, I'm young. I've never been a head coach. You know, like I, but you know, when are you going to get experience? And the thing that I liked is they had the belief in me to be like, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to figure, you're going to have to. And I did, I was honest with them. I said, I'm going to have to lean on you guys a bit to help guide me through the, you know, administrative side, because I, anyone that wants to be a head coach, it's maybe 5% of actual coaching and 95% of administrative work and other, other things. Yes. And so they were able to help lean on that and help me. Um, but they were great in that process. And St. St. Bonnie, since then it's been, it's been great. You know, I had, we had a COVID year and that 
COVID year, we were just happy to play. I think that year, coaches were just scheduling weekly. Like, I yeah. think I, I think I called teams, hey, you want to play this week? We, yep. we got two days. <laughs> I got eight players that tested negative. We're ready to play? All yeah. right. And so first year was kind of just, let's let's just get guys on the floor. And then the second year was the first real year. And um, people looked at me sideways because I scheduled probably way harder than I should have. But <laughs> I had a good group of young players that came in with me that wanted to play college. And I said, okay, you're going to play college, and we're going to go play some college players. And so I remember one week, and, and I just remember getting text messages after the game, like, you're crazy. We played uh, Notre Dame on the road at Notre Dame when they had Ben and Dusty. And we played Orange Lutheran at Orange Lutheran. And then we played Crespi at Crespi. Man. And, I, and I'm going to these games, and, and, and you're not going to – I go – I'm just like, you guys want to be college players. I'm going to show you college players. Yeah. We're going to go play against Ben, Dusty, uh, Peyton White, or I think Orange Lutheran has some some D1 guy. Like, you're going to see it then, and right. you're going to see how hard you're going to have to work because you're sophomores. And we got – we were down – like, we played Notre Dame, and, and I know Coach Sargent, and, and we're cool. But I'm glad he didn't let up because we were down by, like, 50. And I'm like, good. Like, I'm sitting there like, good. You guys need to learn this is the bar that you want to reach. If you want yeah. to be a college player, this is the bar. There's three guys on their team that are D1 players. You have to reach that standard. We played Orange Lutheran. We were down 44-4 to four at half. Man. And I told the guys, you want to be college basketball players, that's the bar. We, you know, we played Crespi and we were down. That's the bar. What did this inspire in them? Losing by that much and showing them the bar. I think there was going to be two things that happened when I did it. Either I'm crazy and they're going to be scared off or they're going to understand how hard they have to work and play there. And I think it paid off as in one of those kids was was Dylan Benner, who's our all-time leading scorer now, and he's going to Army West Point on a full ride. And, awesome. you know, I have another player, Jeremy Goodcase, who's going to play college basketball. He's getting recruited by some some Division two, three NAI schools. So it's like those worked for those two because those were the two that were young. And at first, I think at first they were confused by it, but now those are the most, they're, they're tough. Like they understand there's nothing that fears them. They're afraid in the moment, but they're not afraid anymore. And so that's my whole thing is I'm going to push you out the nest. Mm -hmm. If you fly, like I think you'll fly, you'll fly. If not, you can't. And also too, I tell my players if they want to come play for me, we'll play a few games like that where I know what we might lose. We might lose. There's a high possibility we could lose. I'm putting you out there against a college player to show your opportunity that you can do it against a college player. Yeah. You can't look at me and say, I didn't have the opportunity. Yes, you, you explained did. this to the player. Yes. To the players. I told my I told Dylan and Jared, yeah. you know, my, my two guards that are two players, and they understood that. And that helped elevate them. I think at yeah. first they, you know, they both handled it. It was hard at first, but they it rose them in their games. That's awesome. And so um, I like the honesty. I think coaches do that without saying it without understanding or giving the kids understanding of what they're doing and yeah. there can be trust lost yeah. in that process. But I think the honesty and the transparency of, Hey, this is the plan because this is, and it's for you. I'm not trying to show yeah. that I could play all these top schools or whatever. It's literally for you to develop. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's been my approach. Um, just every year, Hey, we're going to go play in these events that have exposure and they have good teams. We might get our head kicked in. In those events, Section Seven, we've gone every year. I've been at Bonnie. We've been at Section Seven. We went to Cal. We went to Cali Live this past summer. I tell them, we're gonna go in environments that have coaches there. There's high level players there, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have you play. Mm -hmm. If you can't get it done, you can't look at me at the end of the day and say I did not give you a chance to play in front of colleges or people. Right. That's just my thing. Is I want to give I you like that, that opportunity. You can't look at me and say my well, coach doesn't doesn't help me get exposure. No, we went to Section Seven four times. That's there's there's 300 colleges from D1 to right. D3 there. Yes. And and I remember one year we went and we ran into a, a Roosevelt school that uh, they came off an ugly loss. So they took it out on us and we were down <laughs> 50. But I told the guys, hey, we got to play Roosevelt in a game right here in Arizona in front of colleges. And oh. so um, the second oh. year was rough. We were under 500. I We were under 500 and, I, and I'm, I'm OK. Like it was, you know, but those core group guys stayed with me yes. and believed in it. And the third year, we uh, went to CIF finals, and we went 26 and 10, went to CIF championship, and we lost to a team that was better. They were better than us. We played Valencia High uh, School, right. um, and they had Micah Blue, who went to, to Portland, and they had uh, Bryce Bedgood and, and Kai Davis, and they just had a good team. Yes. Um, and the, the thing that I'm proud of that group was, 
I think they beat almost every team in the playoffs, including State, by double digits. We lost by three. And we had a shot to tie it to go into overtime. Like, we had a clean look, and we just missed it. And so I told her, guys, you went blow to blow with a team that was a top-level team. They were really good. Yeah. And we went blow for blow with them and, and, and on a big stage. And I think those moments before got them ready for that moment. And so we ended up playing them in the state regional final in state, and we and played them at their place. I think we lost. It was a close game, and I think we ended up losing by 10. But we can look back and say we, we were ready for every moment, and we went blow for blow with a team that was extremely talented. Um, I love that style. Just a new coach coming in for a first head coaching job and putting them in adversity immediately, but yeah. also coaching them up and showing them how to endure that adversity. Yeah. And um, not being afraid to go play people and pushing them to, hey, let's see how high you can go. Yeah. What is your true potential? Yeah. And, and, and I think that's, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I understand like everyone has, there's different approaches to playing games, but I know every year I want to play at least two, three teams where you are going to have to play your A++ game yeah. to not even beat them, just be in the game. And so every year I feel like you have to do that. You know, this year it was really cool. We got to play at the St. Francis tournament, and we played St. Francis and Mozzie Mosley. And I watched them the night before score 49. And I told her, guys, <laughs> this is awesome. We get to try to stop this. Yes. And so um, just things like that, like every year they can look back and say, we played a really good team. Yeah. We played a really good thing. We went to Ron Massey. We went to and, – and that's the thing as a coach I'm always going to vouch for our guys is – we are going to go, I want to play in front of colleges for you. I want you to at least have that chance to showcase your ability and at least let leave that impression for they can possibly recruit you later. Um, okay. That's my biggest thing is, is I want you to have that exposure in that kind of environment. That's amazing. And so this year, how are we doing this year? And what are we looking forward to, to through the end of the season? Um, so we're 16 and eight right now. Uh, we played uh, Dunn tomorrow, who's really good. They've really good brothers on that team and it's a good team um but we're 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 in a good position right now um you know chasing a league title it'd be back-to-back league titles and hopefully get to back-to-back 21 years um but this group is they're resilient you know we have two i'm i'm happy to say we have two kids that are going to play college basketball awesome. you know dylan like i said going to army and then donald clark um is going to riviera university at d3 and then um like i said jeremy Goodcase is is going to play college basketball so i'm, I'm really happy that with this group um they handle a lot of adversity and they play some good teams and that's just all i can ask for the the wins and losses will shake out but as long as they play really hard i'm I'm happy with this group and i I think they're handling everything really well what are the three things you're telling a first-time head coach to do when they start their program first thing would be establish your culture and stick with it i think Sometimes you want it like if you don't think it's going to work right away, you want it like stick to your beliefs, stick to your guns, stick to your beliefs and just push through. It will eventually shine through. Um, I think second is make sure you are in communication with your administration as much as possible. Um, I think having your athletic athletic department and your administration support is major. And then three, I think just be out there in the community. That doesn't mean be out and you know recruiting kids or anything like that or trying to get kids to come here just be out and about and show that you're not just in this little hole at home you come here go here and go home you know try to be more involved in the community because i think if the community kind of gets behind your program it's kind of more it's it's fun you know the games get fun and i think they'll see that it's a little bit more than just basketball and so i think those are the big major three um that i would i would preach and then two just uh i mean kind of three a three b would be um, just make sure you have the right staff around you. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna be able to do it all on your own. And I'm fortunate, I am fortunate to have some um, coaches in my staff and I have coaches in my staff in general that, that you know, share that vision, that work really hard. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's big too in backing you up. So I'm appreciative of my staff on how hard they work um, too, so. Awesome, man. Man, that, you're a man, man of value discipline and transparency man and um i just appreciate that about you i think that's what shines through everything you do since the first time i've met you yeah. you know and um man, i appreciate that and thank you for sharing yeah, this sure. journey like <laughs> it's a long you, you've journey you've seen you've seen a lot and you're you know a, a kid of an nba player right yeah. and the expectations set against you but paving your own path yeah. and not allowing that to 
drive you a certain way. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Um, yeah. I didn't even have to ask you this question because it didn't never seem to matter. Was there ever pressure for you to be an NBA player? Um, I don't think there was pressure just because I think whatever I wanted to do, my parents said, you just have to be, you have to work hard at it, whatever you chose to do. Um, and so I'm sure when I was younger, looking back, I probably wanted to do that, but I never felt pressure. I awesome. never felt pressure to be in the NBA or play here. I never felt like I had to live up to anything. I just, my parents were just, whatever you choose to do, strive to be the best at it. And so that was the biggest thing. So it was never, I never felt like I had to, you know, come out of this being my dad again and things like that. I think when you, I think when you try to do that is when you have the biggest letdown. And when you have the biggest is when you try to fulfill an expectation and when you yeah. just do it because you love doing it. And so um, I, I, I didn't feel pressure. I, 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 they just told me whatever you choose to do, go 150% at it and go as hard as you can. I love that, man. Shout out to his parents and other parents just hear that. A kid of an NBA player did, didn't feel any pressure to make the NBA, but you guys who are lawyers, doctors, entertainment, whatever you are, are pushing your kid to go to the NBA and you've never even been there. Like, just stop that. I just... Sorry. I just, I just stop. This is this look at look at there's an example of what can happen when you just put the faith in the work right tools into somebody. And so thanks for sharing all that. Absolutely, man. man. Absolutely. All right, we're gonna hop into our next segment. Uh my rushmore. All right, so we're gonna mix it up a little bit today. Top four hip hop artists of all time. Your rushmore. My, who you got? Well it when I say this, it's the artist, okay? Don't look at anything. It's the artist itself, but Kanye West is number one. On, okay. Not number one, but he's <laughs> on mine. That's okay. I tell everyone it's the running joke of he made graduation. Like I told everyone, he made graduation. Thank I you. can listen to that That's all the it. way through. Um, it'd be Kanye West. Uh, I I personally, um, I, I would say it's a kind of a toss-up. I like J. Cole a lot. I think J. Cole is in, in my Mount Rushmore. Um, I would probably go a little bit more... Um, into the 90s and probably say, um, I would say Jay-Z actually. Jay-Z, I guess you can count him as 90s. But 90s, Jay, 2000s, Jay, Jay-Z, it, yeah. <laughs> um, just because of, I mean, you can say everything from his empire to, to what he did music-wise. And then probably, you know, it's funny because people are gonna say Tupac or Biggie, but, and those guys are probably 1A, 1B, or 4, 4A, 4B for me in terms of that. I think those two kind of revolutionized um, a lot of it, but I listen to a lot of. I listen to Mob Deep when they were younger. And, yeah, and those artists, but those are probably my Mount Rushmore. That's my Mount Rushmore. Okay, so yeah, four and a half ish. You got somebody with Two Face, with Tupac and Biggie. Got it. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's yeah, that's where yeah we're going for that one. We're going so for mine, that. mine are my Rushmore. I'm not saying the best. These are Todd's. <laughs> um, actually, J Cole's on mine. So okay. I'm a big J Cole fan. Um, love J Cole. Uh, DJ Quick. I okay. grew up yeah. listening to DJ Quick. My cousin showed me, and um, to this day, I still listen to oh, yeah. DJ Quick at least one album once a month, um, <laughs> just to stay, oh, yeah, stay no, refreshed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's crazy. I'm like, man, these kids are listening to trash, and I listen to DJ Quick. I'm like, why was I listening to this at 13 <laughs> years old? I should not have been listening to this, but it is what it is. Um, third is, it's actually Drake. Man, thought about it. I, I'm, a, I'm a Drake fan, man. I, 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 I love his older stuff. I, you know, new stuff is... I got to catch a vibe. There's some songs I like, some I don't. Mm -hmm. But man, his early stuff was, he was so relatable. It, like with my life experience when he was going. I thought about it. I thought about <laughs> it. Back then when you can burn CDs. Yes. I, I used to have like a Drake CD on the way to school like every day. And I would take yeah. that CD. But I already know, I already know once I get home. My girlfriend's gonna be like, "It's Drake. Drake's in your mouth. But you're lying. No, I, it's it's close. But yeah. I already know Drake. I, I can give you that Drake. So those are three. So three. What was the, who, man, this is a interesting one, because Kanye's there, Eminem is there. I'm not gonna lie, Eminem was. Yeah. Hey, sue me. He's one of the best lyricists ever. <laughs> you got Tupac, Biggie. It's hard. It's tough, but I'm I'm gonna throw a wrench in it, and, and it's who I listen to. Okay. And he's a he's a Christian hip hop artist. So Andy Minio. Oh. See, I know who Andy Minio is. Yes, and, and most people do. So it's, there's Lecrae, and then there's Andy Minio. I, I Lecrae's know, like that. Andy Minio. I know. Shout out to by the way, shout out to Heritage Christian because they play Andy Minio at a lot of times. I make those. Lists. Okay, I was gonna that's say that, those shout are my out, playlists. Say, shout out to you. I'm just saying. I I remember <laughs> we played Heritage my first year, and it was a timeout. 
And I was like, is this Andy Mineo? Like, in my mind, I like, stopped mid-time. Andy Mineo, okay. Like, okay, we're going. And, and the kids are like, who's this? I'm like, you don't know. You don't understand. You don't understand. So I'll, I'll give you that, that. Okay, I understand Andy Mineo on that one. Yeah, no, I, that's who I listen to. Is like, literally, my daughter knows the songs. Like, that's who I listen to. And so those are my hip-hop artists who, like, man, if I could only listen to four more people, those would be the four. So I got from Andy Mineo to DJ Quick. Let's listen. That's Crazy, a variety. But, uh, That's a variety. Hey, I'll give you that. Yes, That's yes. That. Okay. All right. So our next segment is fix the net. All right. So this is uh, a misconception about yourself that people that you heard people may uh, talk about oh, you about, yeah. or a misconception about basketball that you just want to make clear. So uh, let us know what that misconception is. <laughs> clear it up for oh, us. Oh man. And then, uh, finish the play. Mi- finish the <laughs> <laughs> misconception I would say about about me is. Um, is that I, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily about me, but in general, I feel like people think that I'm not, I sh- I'm only working hard for my players. I do think as a coach, if you know other players, you should work hard for them if no one's working hard for them to get recruited. Mm-hmm. And so I try my best to help just anyone in general get recruited, whether, whether you know, even if they go to another school, I'm fine with that. Like, go rock out there, but yeah. I believe coaches should be able to share their resources with each other. And I think that's a misconception that I think a lot of coaches, um, even about me or in general, like I think as a coach, you should be able to help everyone's players, help them get recruited. I think that's kind of a big misconception, a general misconception. And I see this debate once every six months on Twitter is that I, and I'm sure nine, 10 years old, don't play zone defense. That's the only misconception <laughs> I'm going to say. And it's going to be the six month debate that everyone says is the biggest <laughs> misconception that you should be taught man to man growing up playing basketball. But so you should? You, you should. You should. Man, man should be taught. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's probably the two biggest misconceptions. So I'll finish the play right there, <laughs> right through. I love um, it, But those are probably the two biggest things there. Thanks for fixing the net, man. Thank you for being a resource to all players, and thank you for teaching the kids to actually play defense before not playing defense. <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. So this is where we flip the script. You are the interviewer. I'm the interviewee. Two questions for me could be anything in the world. Okay. I would say, I mean, one of the questions is, what what would be your advice um, just to, I would say to parents when, when handling, you know, a younger player that's talented, you know, how, like, what is a way to keep them focused through adversity? What would be kind of your advice? Um, I teach parents when they have a young, talented player to keep them out of the limelight. I actually teach them to do the opposite of what everybody else does is try to push their kid out because the more attention, fame, that they get younger, the expectation gets higher. And so some people can rise to that. And Sky Clark's been famous since he was in sixth grade. He's at Louisville playing. Like, you know, he's he's doing it. It didn't impact him. Yeah, That's literally the only kid I can think of. Everyone else you see who is very talented, young, and had a lot of attention on them, um, their things didn't work out exactly how they thought they were, right? Even Sky, Sky was supposed to be a one and done. Yeah. No, he's still a freaking pro. Yeah. He's a player, right? He's, he's going to make it. It's Absolutely. just his, his journey was a lot different than what everybody thought even, Absolutely. right? And so I tell them to keep them out of the limelight and keep them in the gym. Yeah. Make sure their process, make, they, make sure they fall in love with the process of getting better yeah. and um, understanding everything that comes with it. Okay. Being a pro is not about the level you play. It's about how you live your life. Yeah. And that's what I tell people. If you live like a pro... That's what Sky, man, Sky is a great example because Sky lived like a pro. Yeah. In the gym, 6 a.m., went to school, was in the gym at lunch, went to practice, was in the gym after, yeah. ate clean, took care of his body, strength yeah. and conditioning, rehab, you know, all these things. He, he lived his life as a pro. And luckily, he had his dad who was a pro football yeah. player who understood that. Yeah. But that information is out there. Yeah. And so I just tell them to keep them in the gym and have a plan and yeah. a process and keep their circle tight. Mm-hmm. keeping that circle tight is important and so that's that's what we actually we built this for my consulting company yeah. the basketball firm that does that we help families build blueprints for whoever mm-hmm. your player is they could have never touched the basketball before yeah i could build a plan to put together to get them close to their goal yeah. or get them on their way to the goal to teach them success principles yeah. more than it is about the basketball goal because yeah. basketball is going to end one yeah. day for all of us that's, and so yeah. um yeah, so call me, actually. If you need help with your elite player, <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> I will help you. <laughs> um, the second question, and this is kind of uh, not an ongoing debate, but just something I've always talked about um, in general. Do you think kids do not play enough pickup basketball anymore? 
100%. It, it, so in core, we yeah. do pick up basketball every day. Yeah. Um, there is some form of playing at the end of every session. We have an hour and a half a day. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 15 to 20 minutes of just playing. Mm -hmm. And on Fridays, we're straight pickup ball. And okay. it's been like that since year one. It's yeah. going on our 10th year. Pick up. Everybody loves Fridays because we literally line up on the sideline. <laughs> team captains, pick your team. No coaches, no refs. And they just hoop. Now, if it gets too ugly, we yeah, say, hey, uh, clean it up. Yeah. Everybody's standing around. Let's get some yeah. movement. It's the, that's the most that we say. Yeah. Call your own fouls. And we make sure the scuffle stay light. Uh, I, I was, and that was, I was just wondering just because I, I think it's a lost art is, yeah. is pick up basketball. Um, and so that's why I was kind of asking you. I know you're, you're, you're around, you know, um, the, the training and kids and everything as well. And just kind of that was the one thing I was just curious just because I yeah. feel like I don't know if it's an unpopular opinion, but I think kids overtrain in terms yes. of just chairs, cones, whatever, stationary shooting or drills mm -hmm. instead of just playing. Yep. And I think that's cool. I think that's like the missing art in youth basketball is like pickup is I remember that was the thing. We're gonna be four PM twenty four hour fitness. That was the thing. You just knew twenty four hour yep. fitness, you go at four PM to any twenty four hour fitness nearby, it was rocking. Yep. And so I just that's that's something I just wasn't sure. If other people thought that, that I just feel like pick up is the true hoopers. We all talk about it. We try to create spaces where kids Air West they just hoop over there. Oh yeah, yeah. They do a little training, and then they just hoop. <laughs> you know, it, it is it's it's um that's what it's about. It, yeah. It's the kids. You name three kids today that all were a part of core: Ben, Dusty, and Mozzie. Yeah. Look at their game. It's free flowing reading. Yes. And it's because they just hoop, especially yes. Dusty and Ben. Like that year was crazy. We had them, Mike, Mike, Scott. It was crazy. The pickup games were better than some high school games. Uh, and it was competition every single day they stepped on hey, the floor. Hey, we talked scout. That scout with Ben and Dusty was like, <laughs> well, they're going to shoot it, and you just hope they're cold. <laughs> but right. no, those two could play. But, yeah, I'm just yeah. – that was the biggest thing is I just wish there was more pickup in general. Yeah. And I think people need to go away from a little bit more of the skilled individual training and more of just playing some pickup ball. Um, true pickup ball, too. Not, not the – one pass, put it up, like some actual movements and things like yeah, that. They need OG. So the other part is um, getting high school players in the gym with middle school kids to teach them how to play. And then college kids playing with the high school kids yeah. and creating those spaces where you we had an OG that tell us what to do in the pickup games before we were allowed to yep. play freely. Yeah. They would let us rock out, but only if we're setting screens, moving without the ball, cutting, yeah. and doing the things that basketball allows you to do with pickup. Yeah. So. That was, we definitely had those at 24 Hour Fitness, some, some OGs that... When I was 14 years old. I caught, I still caught elbows at 14. They didn't care about right. that. No, but I was no. like, I, you either got, you got tougher or, you know, and, and so that's, and, and the mentality always was. And I, uh, the last thing I, t I told our guys in, in games, in a big game, treat this like it's a five game wait at 24 hour fitness and you don't want to get off the floor. And it's game point. <laughs> and, and his game, and his game and point. Fouling almost every time. Oh <laughs> man! Now that part I'm saying we don't have to do, but you yeah, got to yeah, play yeah. defense like his game point. Absolutely, man. Yeah, so. Man, appreciate you, man. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So we have a 24 you, second shot clock. That's your camera right there. Let the people know where they can find you and um, something that's developing in your world and or just some encouraging words for the people. Yeah, um, you know, the, the way to find me is on Twitter, you know, Wolfgang underscore Wood or Instagram, Wolfgang Wood underscore. Uh, Sarah's Basketball is another way too, uh, or Sarah's B-Ball on Twitter. But the biggest thing I just want to tell people is just work hard and you can't, you can't fake the work. You got to work really hard. You have to do the right thing. It's okay. Do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because you feel like you're obligated to do it. Just continue doing the right things. It's the right thing. So that's my message. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.